changes in habitat. The next question is even more difficult to answer. Is there climate change? Is there climate change? You know, is, is the climate changing in the sense, like, let's say, in the continental USA, are there more severe storms than there used to be on the continent? Some people say, oh God, there was a big one last year, and it was so, it was terrible, and there was this huge typhoon, and there was this, and there was that. It turns out, when you look at it, every time that you go to an expert historical climatologist who studies statistics about the weather, and about storms, and about forest fires, and about all these things, and they write, and they, and they study this for years and years, and they write these papers, they always say, it's within statistical variability. We can't see a change. Over the last, you know, we've been measuring tree rings for a thousand years. We don't see a change in intensity of forest fires over that time. We don't see a change, and so on. They have all these proxies if they, as far as way they can go. And from the time that we've been doing human observations and measuring with thermometers and so on, statistically, we're not seeing a change. It's, there, there's no evidence of, since the industrial era, the weather and weather events having changed. And this is something that I debated uh, on, on RT with, the, with this guy that called me a mineralogist. You know, there, there's just no, there's no evidence for that. I have gone and read all these reports. And what you typically find is these historical climatologists are the, then become teams of bigger sort of governmental panels that then uh, speak to and have some inter, you know, some of the scientists are also members of the IPC and so on. And then they put everything together and then the scientists say, you know, there isn't really convincing evidence. We're not sure. We don't think the probabilities are da 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 da. And then when they write the, they write up the uh, executive report, um, there's 95% certainty that the burning of fossil fuel has caused some changes. Okay, but then when you go and read the report, it's not there. It's, you know, careful scientists qualifying everything they say, and especially the historical climatologists, which are the guys that I really, I, I really respect them from reading their papers. Uh, they're the ones that I trust. Not these modelers that project things, having never gone out into the field, having never analyzed the data themselves. So, is there climate change is, is, a, is a much more subtle question. And then there's, in the latter, there's the next question. Is there warming? Oh my God, what a heretic I am to even ask that question. Is there warming? Is there evidence for warming? Okay, so, so if you look at the temperature data, we're talking about a, a quarter of a degree or a tenth of a degree. And you look at the change in temperature, let's say delta T as a function of time, and let's say this is, I don't know, 1900 and this is present, and uh, around, uh, you know, 1950 it started to shoot up. So in terms of the, fo the fossil fuel uh, burning went something like this, and then around 1950 it really started to come up and now it's been doing something like this, right? And, but that's the fossil fuel burning in, 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 and this is zero. But now if you look at delta T as a function of time, um, they're doing all this fancy stuff and they're finding that, okay, there was some changes and then there was some increases and so on. And recently, in the last 20 years, it's done this. It's flat. <coughs> In the last 20 years, it's been, it's, they call it a pause. So all these climate, all these modelers were fitting their models beautifully to this part of the curve and projecting that it was going off into space over here. And they were all projecting that and saying, look, it's clear, it fits, and that's where we're going. 20 years from now, we're going to be up there. Okay? And then, what happened? This happened. It didn't really happen. I want to talk about that. 
But that happened. And then you look at the top physics paper, one of the top ones, Nature. And all the papers, starting around here, a whole bunch of papers are trying to explain how did the modelers get it so wrong? I mean, we have to admit we got it wrong. How did that happen? So then you've got all these papers about how did we get it so wrong? You know? So first you've got all these papers about how we're so clever and we're getting it all right. And then you've got all these papers about how did we get it so wrong? And uh, you know, it's not like they're able to do it any better now than they did 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, this is, this is pretty tenuous stuff. Now, how did this happen? We're talking about really small variations in temperature, and this is the average. I'll give you my personal opinion about what's going on here. I haven't looked at the data myself, but I've talked to a lot of people and I've dealt with similar kinds of data before. I think that this data is highly sensitive to how you treat it, how you decide to correct for altitude, how you decide to correct for the fact there's only a thousand weather stations, how you decide to put in these other things and so on, how you decide to correct for the fact that old thermometers didn't work the same as, as new thermometers. How do you decide to correct for the fact that originally we were measuring the temperature of the, of the ocean surface by using a bucket, pulling the water up, putting it on the surface of the ship and sticking our thermometer in and so on. And this has a systematic, how do you correct for all these things? Plus, how do you correct for how you do that averaging over the surface, which is the most important thing? Well, I think everyone was happy to follow this path and correct away in a way that produced that path. The problem is the data is not really doing that. So there comes a point where you just can't correct that much anymore. And so you have to, you can only fudge so much. And I think this is a fudge plateau. I think that's the limit of how much you can fudge. And they've kind of admitted that now. No, I and, and have, I no? no, 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 they haven't admitted it. You're, you're, I, they haven't admitted it, sorry. Um, it's understanding in the Arctic. Yeah. Okay, the warming in the Arctic has been tremendous in yeah. the last 20 years. Um, and if you account for the Arctic properly, right. then you do get a, a hiatus or pause is, is um, not, not real. Like they, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, but, uh, but, but, um, okay, but, what, what, what were they doing with the Arctic during this whole period over here? Well, the Arctic was, wasn't warming. The amplification of the Arctic was not as significant. Um, you know, it's, it's taken off in the last 20 years, and you're undersampling the, the Arctic effect on the global. global but you see, the, this averaging does okay. does not does not does not take into account undersampling. Okay. Okay. Well, another, another they, they, they don't average by, by doing the average number of all the weather stations. That's not how it works. This is a surface-wise average right. and over time. Right. So, in principle, undersampling is not supposed to have an effect at all. Well, there's been no cause in Arctic warming in the last two decades. So the temperature rise in the Arctic is about a degree Celsius per decade. And it hasn't stopped over 30 years, 30 years or so. I, I haven't seen, I haven't looked at that, and I, I haven't seen it. The, data, but the, best, um, the best thermometer is the ocean. Okay, the ocean, the sea level is rising because the ocean is expanding because it's warming. So this is a better thermometer than anything else. If sea level rise uh, stop rising, then you would argue that. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but there are many possible causes for the rise of the sea level other than thermal expansion of the water itself. You know, I mean, I just, I don't buy these things. But that's the biggest, that's, that's, that's I, I, what the scientists are saying. Of course, I mean, the scientists are saying all kinds of stuff, uh, right? No, but for measurements, um, the other thing is there are, if you talk to Hansen's work on extreme weather statistics, if you talk to Ramsdorf and, um, um, if you talk to Jason Box and all of their all of their data is the statistical data showing that weather extremes have increased. Who I would believe the insurance I, I, companies. I, the every world, every time I every time I prepare for one of the okay insurance the insurance claim there's no doubt it's through the roof of course because things cost more to fix and there's more people where storms are happening and of course that's going to go through the roof that's not the point but if. Every time I've gone and studied this, the, the historical climatology reports and their original papers 
And then you, and typically you get this big national report of all the climatology studies put together, and then you say, whew, okay, those are the conclusions. Now let me look at some of the individual papers. You go to the most cited individual papers, and they say more along the lines of it's not changing. And I've done this several times, and every time that's what I find. When I take the trouble to go and read it, what the politicians are saying in writing the report is different from what the scientists are saying who actually did the work. So I don't believe that, and I won't believe it until I see it, you know. And every time I talk to, th this is, for example, this is uh, the, the, the Wikipedia list of all the scientists that are kind of opposed the mainstream view. And a lot of these people I've talked to personally, like Richard Lindzen, I interviewed him. I used to have a radio show every week, and I interviewed him for an hour, and we talked for a long time. He's at MIT, and he's quite a guy. Um, there's a, I'm in that list, too. And there's um, all these people who, when I talk to them, and I've talked to several of them, they tell a very different story from these IPCC reports. And they're amazed at how, and that some very famous people, I could give you examples. I have this climate blog where I sometimes talk about these people. Hey, does Paul have business? Paul? Do you have a list of names? But, um, uh, well, everybody else, I guess. <laughs> but what I'm trying to, well, let, let me put it this way. Um, for example, there was this study that said that, was it, 97% of scientists agree that there's global warming. And I said, wow, man, I gotta look at that. So I went and read the paper. And they're citing sources, so I went to read the sources. And as I dug deeper and deeper, I found that this was a meaningless paper. They would basically take a paper that in the introduction, by someone who was not a climatologist, that in the introduction to sell their paper, to sell the importance of their paper, would talk about global warming and say, aha, this person agrees with global warming. So they would count this in like that, you know? So I did a critique of one of these papers in detail and put it on my blog there. Every time I look at some of these outrageous claims, I realize that they're fudging it and that they're basically, they're lying. And I ask myself, why is this happening? Why, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I don't want that, no. But the thing is, all these scientists appear to have a vested interest in this being true and in insisting by stamping their feet on the floor that the debate is over. There is no more debate. All the scientists agree. Come on, guys. There's a lot of really smart people who have made their careers in this thing who don't agree with you, okay. you know? Okay, and, so, and so don't look at people. Look at the scientific, very good scientific publications yeah. that are on, on climate change that are for that are saying it's happening and they're saying That's right. And, and so that's there not are 97%. That's no. That's like uh, thousands and thousands of people. No, that's not at all. That's not true at all. I, I reviewed a paper that did that, that did that. Yeah. and critiqued it. It's nothing like what you're saying. Well, in, fact, in fact, it's, it's, much, it's, it's much more like, well, you'd have to read what I critiqued there, and I don't want to open it up and start reading it, you know, but uh, it was more like, uh, who are the reputable uh, climate scientists? Well, they're the people who have published at least, let's say, 200 articles in the field, and, okay, who are these people, whether they're the big leaders of labs and so on? Okay, now, if you look at the people who are deniers, are they famous people like that who have published that much? Generally not. Only 10% of them have published more than 100 papers, you know? And the, the, so they qualify it like that, and they use these artificial criteria. But what I would say in answer to that is, well, there's 10% of scientists who've studied over, a, who've published over 100 papers in climate science who don't agree. That's significant, guys. Come on, like... Think about this, they're not, you know, they're, they're going against the current and they're saying something that's unpopular. They're going to be opposing referees when they publi try to publish their papers, yet they insist on saying something that is against the current. You have to take that into consideration. These are the kinds of arguments, I think, that we have to think about. So this, this whole notion that the debate is over, I think, is just pure nonsense. Um, I agree. 
You know, the debate is over. The, everyone agrees that the Earth is round. Everyone agrees that the Earth goes around the sun. The debate is over on those questions. Okay? Those questions, the debate is over. There's lots of questions where the debate is over. And there's a whole bunch of other questions where it's far from over and we have to wait and see if, the, if, if, if some of these people who are funded the way they are will come to their senses one day. But the water is uh, getting warmer, so they have less uh, ice, right? But you said that... No! I understand correctly that... You said that that has nothing to do with the uh, global warming or CO2 or something. Well, there's two things in answer to no, the you ice. Say that. One is the ice covers in the last year or so have been more than in the last 10 or 20 years, okay? Like, they, 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 they're breaking records in Antarctica, they're breaking records in, in, in the North Pole. There's a lot of ice cover these days, okay? That's one thing. Secondly, with regards to ice and snow in the, in the Arctic and so on, there are effects that are, I think, greater than warming that you can't even detect. Local climate effects that are going to be due, for example, when you're talking about ice and snow, that, that's a very high albedo. If you have a little bit of pollution in terms of particulate matter, like if you have huge forest fires in Africa and you're spreading that stuff on the ice, uh, that's going to change the albedo of the ice quite significantly and that is going to have a huge effect because it's about radiation. The sun is the greatest mover of everything on the planet. The, how, how hot you feel when you go outside depends on how the, whether or not the sun is shining on you more than what the uh, weather person said that the temperature was that day. The, you know, radiation is huge. There's like um, something like uh, 500 or 300 watts on average per meter squared striking the earth. It's a huge amount of energy. The amount of energy from all fossil fuel burning is like 0.006% of the energy of the sun striking the earth. It's minuscule in compared to the effect of the sun. So uh, you can do these calculations very, very quickly and I, and I, I did them in, in, in several of my papers. The, you know, you, let's keep things in perspective. People want to believe that humans are important and are having these big effects, but we're just not that important. And the, the, the place where we are important is we're able to kill each other. We're able to do serious damage to other people. And that's where we have the biggest effects on people's lives. And that's the kinds of things we could change easily, much more easily than trying to control what our planet is doing. See, we're not, we're not paying enough attention to the concept that this is a planet. It's freaking huge. It's got, its surface is complicated, it's, it's vegetation. Look, when I studied the boreal forest, just to give you an example, okay, we said, okay, we've got a fairly small region here with thousands of lakes in it, and we've picked a hundred to study them, and the, the, the researchers that are collaborating with us, who are soil scientists, have gone and taken a hundred samples in the same region. So we're going to try to figure out if the chemistry of the lake and the chemistry of the sediments of the lakes and the physical properties of the sediment is related to the soil in the same region. So we're going to try to correlate the soil type and the soil geochemistry to what's happening in the lake. Let's do that. And I had a bunch of students and there were uh, really clever uh, science students that were hired during the summer and they went through all this data and they were using this sophisticated software and they're looking at all this and I said, now you've got to find the relationships. Be creative. Go out there and find the relationship between the soil and what's happening in the lake. I want you to figure this out. It's your job. And I remember there was a team of uh, two at one point that I put on this and they were working together. And um, he had a crush on her, but that's a different story. Um, and they, you know, they, 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 they weren't able to find any connection. And I kept telling them there has to be something. Look at, look at the rare, look at the heavy elements. Look at the organic content. Look at, look at everything. It's the water chemistry. Do it. I mean, figure out what the connection is. There has to be one. A lake is affected by its catchment area. Come on, find a connection. They couldn't. And finally, they, they figured out what was going on. I didn't because I wasn't with the data. I couldn't figure it out. 
And they came to me, you know, kind of afraid to announce this bad news. And they said, Denis, they said, we're never going to find a, a relationship because the soil changes from spot to spot. They went in there and took a hundred samples in the same region, but it was nowhere near the hundred lakes that we happened to pick. We're picking the nearest ones, but between the soil sample that we picked and the lake that we're trying to correlate it to, there's ten other different kinds of soil here. And there's streams going by, and there's all kinds of stuff happening. We can't find a relationship. And we think that's why. And I said, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. And then I, you know, as I read more about the data, I figured out, yeah, you, if you're going to do that kind of study, you have to actually have a soil scientist studying the soil right next to the lake or stream. You can't just do it like that and hope that in a geographer's average way, you, you'll be able to figure something out. You can't. It's way too complicated. Okay? Yes? Sorry, so like two points. Yes. Like Scale, like for larger mammals, but uh, if you actually look at this as a scale for a lot of marine life, there is a lot of bleaching of, for example, a lot of bleaching of coral. Right. Happening, yes. Correlated with the warming of the water. Now I can't say that this is true because of the scope of warming, because I don't know what has happened in the past. Right. If you look at photographs and see how lifeless it has become. Yes. You can't just say that. There. Right. I'm not denying that there are not changes, massive changes occurring in ecosystems. I would never deny that. Um, but there are people who are trying to relate that so-called bleaching and the death of these corals to changes in the pH of the ocean water. I'm sorry, but no one has ever been able to measure the pH of seawater and, and follow its changes. That's impossible to do. pH is just like uh, what I was explaining with soil. If it's a sunny day, you get a different pH at the same spot and, and so on. Right? You, have you done these kinds of measurements? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I understand it because, I mean, as a science student, when you sit down and think about the factual things like Earth is round, they put a microscope and 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 they pH is a, one of these properties like temperature. It's just highly variable, uh, affected locally by all kinds of things. You can't measure pH in a reliable way, right? We, in, in our lakes, we had to go down deep at a specific depth, uh, collect a sample where it was dark and so on in order to get a reliable pH. So ocean pH where there's coral and sunlight and so on, there's no way you're going to measure that. And the changes, the, the, no one's detecting any system systemic changes in actual pH. And also pH is something that is highly buffered, you know. It, it, it's very hard to change the pH of a large body of water. Um, so I, and some people, yeah, but it's the coral that's buffering it. No, I, I don't believe it. There's, there's, so, there's so much that could be causing this coral to die. I just don't believe that. What, what about the, the, the pH of the um you know, the CO2 level of the atmosphere yes. is much, much higher yes. right, than it was during the uh, last million years. Yes. Between 200 and 300 parts per uh, 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 400. Um, so when it rains, it pulls CO2 out and it goes into the ocean. Yeah, I know, but that's what's called the theoretical geochemistry that gives you a nice explanation that allows you to say we should be worried. But in fact, okay, look, first of all, in terms of CO2, most of the time here, we had 20 times more CO2 in the atmosphere than we do now. And these animals and plants were flourishing like crazy. I don't think we would die from it, okay? The, and there was complex marine life, there was all, all kinds of stuff happening, okay? 20 times more CO2 than now, most of the time. That's the first thing. Secondly, I understand what you're saying about the simple lab chemistry of how CO2 affects pH, how it's, and all that kind of stuff. But the, the, the point is, in nature, it's always much more complicated than that. It's not a test tube. There's hundreds of reactions happening. I know, as a theoretical geochemist, part of my team, we were modeling these reactions. We actually did geochemical modeling of sediments and water columns and everything, and we had to add all those reactions in and see how everything fit together. And I was always amazed to see that 
this was horribly complicated and was nothing like a test tube. And that it, it was incredibly robust as well. The, the buffering reactions are very powerful. So you, we, you couldn't predict what was going to happen, even in these models. Imagine what it's like in nature. Okay, well, then let's like the shell finisher. You know, what so about the oyster industry off the West Coast? What I don't do deny mean, that. Look, they're not, it's too acidic for, for them to be viable anymore. I mean, a lot of it, you know, like my, my reply to that is that that's probably a lot of crap in the sense that you're probably dealing with a toxicity, not a change in pH. I, I studied a lake in, in Japan, Lake Biwa, the largest uh, lake in Japan, one of the oldest lakes in the world. They had an oyster industry there and they wondered why it died. Okay? So we have to look at that. Well, it, it, turned, it, it, it turned out that, and they thought, well, you know, there's more and more development on the lake even though we try to protect it. Maybe, you know, there's more farming, there's more in-stream, there's more this, there's more that, what's going on? Well, it turned out that it, it, it had collapsed, the industry had collapsed just after a major typhoon. And the major typhoon had stirred the water in this very deep Lake Biwa, stirred up some of the sediment, caused some reactions that normally wouldn't have occurred in a, in a, in a sediment that is not stirred, and that changed the chemistry to the point where now that was fatal to those oysters. So every time there's a major storm, the oysters fail. Had nothing to do with anything else that, that everyone was worried about. And it took us a while to figure this out, but that's, that, that, that was the answer. So, you know, it most, let me give you another example, which is one that I've written about. And this is one that David Suzuki likes to mention. This great success that I say, no, that, it was nothing like that. It's, the, it's this whole thing about acid rain. You know, acid rain, well, that's right, you don't hear about it anymore. Well, let me tell you the story, okay? So, acid rain is going to kill the entire boreal forest, the biggest ecosystem on the planet. Oh my God, we've got to save the planet, we've got to save the ecosystem, acid rain. There are these, the Americans are burning coal like, like they're crazy and it's producing all these uh, uh, sulfides and, and, and the, the rain is acidic and therefore it's destroying uh, life in the boreal forest and it's the Americans fault and so we have to control emissions on these coal mines so we go in and we control emissions and we stop the acid rain and so on okay what really happened first of all you couldn't the, the acidification of the rain was so weak at the time of, of that it was worse that you couldn't measure it there was a, a Canadian team that had to go and find a pristine lake in northern Ontario just to be able to hopefully try to measure if there was an acidification effect on this lake and they could never see one, okay? First thing, you couldn't see the effect. Secondly, the boreal forest was affected dramatically and it had nothing to do with acidification. It had to do with a cottage industry, overfishing, land development, mining development. It had to do with all these things and it destroyed uh, fish stocks in the, in the boreal forest and it destroyed a lot of the lakes and so on but it was all due to this human activity it had nothing to do with acid rain meanwhile everyone's going acid in acid rain and totally ignoring the mining industry totally ignoring everything else and it was perfect because acid rain was something in the sky and scientists were occupied trying to measure its effect and they, it was so subtle you couldn't see it and so they were arguing for more money to see it better because they were sure this had to be the problem. And so they spent decades and decades studying these pristine lakes. Meanwhile, there's this, you know, all-out destruction on the boreal forest that just happened, irrespective of all that. Okay? This is another example like that. Uh, the, reason, the reason that carbon and CO2 are on everybody's mind and all the scientists are talking about it is because the forces that be want this to happen. They want carbon pricing globally and they want a carbon economy. And this is a geopolitical lever by the United States and when you fund 
if you ask yourself what science is going to be done in Canada or the US, what's the answer? The science that will be done is the science that's funded. Period. There is no academic freedom in science. There's only an illusion of academic freedom. Okay? So if the funding agencies see global warming studies in a positive light and they fund that, that's what's going to get done. If you say to the funding council, as a scientist, I make a, a grant application and I say, I don't believe the way that uh, the statistical method in which the average earth temperature is being evaluated by these guys, I want to go and get the raw data. I want to put a team of postdoctoral fellows and students. I want to learn advanced statistical techniques. I want to go in there and test different scenarios of doing the averages and look at this in detail with a physicist eye collaborating with some mathematicians and I want to get to the bottom of this. I just don't believe it. If I write a nice grant application and present that and have top-notch collaborators from around the world that are mathematicians, statisticians and so on, they will say, there's no interest in that. What are you, crazy? Of course there's warming. Everybody, all the people on the committee are going to tell you they're warming and they're, they're, they're funding other people who are studying warming and this guy wants to question its very existence. What are you, nuts? Well, wait a minute. This is exactly what the Berkeley Earth Sciences people did, and they didn't think the statistics, they thought exactly as you that the statistics were not uh, right. were wrong. And right. They, they concluded that the statistics are fine and there is warming. Right. right. This is a whole group so the Berkeley. one that got funded concluded the right thing. Well, no, they didn't. They, they were against it. That was in their yes. original view. And yes. Eventually you're always against it when you write the grant proposal. Well, no, you should do so. You should just say you want to study it and see whether, you know, you have an open mind, right? You want to look at the statistics. And I don't know about that, this particular study, but I know about an older uh, Canadian researcher who did this and who unambiguously said this was a lot of crap. Okay. Um, but, and, and I read his paper and studied his paper, but I don't know this more recent one that you're referring to. I'd have to look at it and I'd have to... And, and what I find when I go and read those papers a lot of the times, and they, they'll often, because they were well funded, they get published in high level uh, journals, right? And then those high level journals don't bother to insist that they include all their raw data so people can actually check what they did. And that's a real fight. So I have a friend, for example, who wrote a book about this, this about the IPC and the politics of the IPC recently, who insulted a big uh, climate expert in the US who got sued for defamation <coughs> for doing that, and then people from around the world sent him hundreds of thousands of dollars so he could defend himself. You, you know, I'm Tim Ball is who I'm talking about. And so Tim Ball said, I'm going to defend myself, and my defense is truth. So I want to see your data. Let's have the data. So, so people funded him so he could get the data. Well, he's having a heck of a time getting data, even you, in a lawsuit where you have a legal obligation under discovery to get the data, they're just not giving the data. So it, it's a premise of science that you, another scientist has to be able to check everything you did. And when you can't even get the raw data and you can't even know what algorithms they used to fudge that raw data or to manipulate it or to put it into their program and you can't know what the code of the program is. You can't know anything unless you're part of the in-group who is, you know, sworn by your professional ties never to break these vows that you're going to be critical of them. That's the situation we're in right now. That's the situation we're in. And um, I've seen this a lot in, in my scientific work and I, and well, ClimateGate was a good example of this. You've heard of ClimateGate. I, I don't know if you studied the, the papers from ClimateGate, but, you know, a postdoctoral fellow decided to leak a bunch of emails from these senior scientists at the Climatology Institute in the UK, and these senior scientists were discussing how they were going to fudge the data, why they needed to fudge the data, how they were going to justify fudging the data, and how the people who were critical of them, they were going to block their publications, and make sure they don't publish in the good journals, and how they were going to achieve this, and so on. This was the climate gate emails, thousands of emails that, that, that someone with a moral sense decided to make public. And, uh, and the, the, the scientists involved were like, oh, this is normal, there's no problem here, this is how science is done, you know, of course we have these discussions among ourselves, but 
we're, we're, we're completely ethical when it comes to what we actually do, but we have these, you know, and so on. Come on, guys. You know, so we got, we got to see how a lot of this is happening. Well, that's what science is like. It's a dirty game. And if you don't realize it's a dirty game, it's because you're so blind, you've been blinded by the game itself. Right? I see this kind of stuff even in archaeology where there's absolutely nothing at stake. You saw the exact same scenario you described where you know some professor tries to block other guys for publication no, but because he's upset that they No, no, but there is stuff. a lot at stake. It's always the same thing that's at stake is uh, careers. Well, yeah. It's about careerism. That's what's at stake. This is what drives the profession. And so you've got the, the, the funding agencies and their, and their councils and their committees decide where the funding is going to go and then the people who want to advance their careers jump in there and do what's needed and make sure that it gets done the right way to advance their careers. This, this is the establishment of science. This is how it happens. And if you are critical of it, you get ostracized and you, know, you don't get published in the best journals and you don't get a lot of funding and so on. And that, people on that list that I showed you, that's the situation that they're in. Well, they get their funding from the no. 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 If you, if you, I would, I would challenge you to go and get that list and add up the funding that they get from fossil fuel companies, and then add up the funding of as many uh, alarmist scientists and that get it from national agencies and so on, and compare the numbers. Now, there's a couple of studies that have done this, and it's staggering. You're talking about an order of magnitude difference, okay? The money is where the grant money is for those scientists that are doing that work. You know, the, the majority of scientists are, are, are pushing this thing, are getting funded. That money is coming from somewhere. How can that be true in Canada? Because we have a government that's like openly hostile to climate change research. I thought they were shutting down research. Yeah, they fired many, many climate scientists. Well, you know, the, the Canadian establishment, they, they get their papers reviewed by international reviewers. You know, they're, they're all tied in that way. Yeah, but the funding's so tough. Well... I know the United States is like 10 times bigger, but, you know, they're still funding. The big, the big projects don't get funded, that's right. But all the small, what are called uh, science operating grants, you know, I mean, there is some freedom to go along with the mainstream. It's the peer review. The peer review is, is the biggest control mechanism of all, right? Um, in fact, it was invented to control science in the interest of the government. Peer review did not exist in, in, uh, before about 1950. Albert Einstein got one of his papers peer reviewed the first time at Physical Review and he freaked out. He was so insulted. It's, just, it's like the editor is sending my paper that I sent him in confidence to someone else to evaluate. That's never going to happen again. He never submitted a paper to physical review ever again in his entire career. He was so insulted. Peer review did not exist until the, the funding agencies in the U.S. and the government decided this would be the best way, the most efficient way is to have self-control. Uh, and uh, they, they, they installed the program that way. So uh, the, 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 the same thing? Is that ultimately the, the goal? To make, to make sure that the research is not daring and creative and exploring new areas for the good of mankind, you know, to make sure that that doesn't happen, to make sure that it's all about careerism and following the main trend, and the main trend is set by the main funding agencies, which in the U.S. is the military and uh, you know some big agencies like that, like the Department of Energy and so on. They set the trends, and then everyone who, who gets funding from there, they are the peer reviewers of everyone else, and you know that's where you're going. As so, a mechanism to construct objective knowledge, is it not logical to send papers? different sources of information. Yeah. yeah, but that's what you do when you when you do the scientific work. You are constantly... Well, when it gets published, it's still going to go to other scientists and other scientists are going to read it. So the mechanism is in place to study them. No. 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 No, no, no. That's, that's not... Our argument is 
corrupted from the original? No, 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 no. The, the purpose of peer review is not that at all. See, what, what you had before, which was much, much better, was all this discussion that you wanted to have, if you wanted to have it, you had it. Then you sent your paper off when you were satisfied with it. You sent it off to be published. The, the editor uh, had to, as a scientist, evaluate if this was scientifically sound enough to be published. Once he made that decision, he published it. After it was published, everyone in the world could disagree with it. Everyone in the world could give their opinion about it. Everyone in the world could repeat your experiment to see if it was true, could do whatever they wanted. That's where the scientific discussion came from. But at the way it works now is, you can't even get published for everyone to be able to see it. Okay? So once peer review was installed, a lot of people just, just couldn't, couldn't get published in the journals that people were reading and in the journals that were widely distributed because the peer reviewers were competitors of these authors and so on. It's, it's an internal kind of censorship, well, blocking, competitive kind of nastiness. Like there's, it, it was routine for review, it still is routine for reviewers to sit on papers, not review them for months and months. In other words, to stall while their students are repeating or using the good idea and then publishing before. There's lots of cases of that. It's, it's well documented. Uh, huh? You want to read Oh, this is the trick. In science, you have to decide for yourself. You read the ideas, you read the content, you read the logical argument, and you have to decide for yourself if you're going to agree with this scientist or not. You don't believe it because some committee has reviewed it and it's published in a good journal which is what people are doing now a lot of the time, okay? A lot of career scientists, they don't even ask themselves if it's true or not. They just say, well, it was published in physical review letters, or it was published in Nature, or it was published in Science, so I know everyone's citing it, so I'm not going to oppose it, I'm going to use it. Okay, they, the, the question of truth is not entering anymore. It's, what do I need to do to publish in the best journals? And what do I need to do not to upset the people who are publishing in the best journals? Okay? And because they're the leaders, they're the ones that are getting good funding and so on. And it doesn't matter if it's not scientific? Of course it doesn't matter. It's completely secondary. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a career. It's a career. It's an establishment. It's not, it's not a, a machine that seeks truth. Truth is, um, truth is something, it, truth is a character defect. Someone who searches for truth has a character defect. They're, they're at a disadvantage. They're going to publish less. They're going to give themselves more trouble. They're going to have more sleepless nights. They're at a real disadvantage compared to these guys. Does that mean any does this, um, but you were, you were asking about the peer review uh, process, my friend. Does, does this make sense to you, what I'm saying about my criticism of, well, when of I the at, establishment? When I, when I look at a, um, the source of information, for example, I don't just look at the who it was published by. Of course, I read through the paper and decide myself what is reputable or not, but the purpose of having peer reviewed journals is to have a institution of knowledge that is respected to look at papers and decide what is. Because yes. no one will argue with me that Wikipedia is a good source of information. You can go to Wikipedia and find a tremendous amount of good information on Wikipedia, but it's from a open source uh, of communism, essentially, of, in, of information. Mm -hmm. that together they build their sources. Now, the sources on Wikipedia can reference a lot of different things and go through them, but it's just an institution. And I can see that you're saying that it's been corrupted, there's a lot of... No, no, I, I don't think Wikipedia has been corrupted. No, no, I mean the peer review journals that uh, you are mentioning. Yeah. I mean, well, be that as it may, it doesn't seem like that, that was ever a of a peer-reviewed journal to become so uh, career-oriented as you might say. No, no, I, you have to distinguish between the architects of the system and the players within the system. The, most of the players within the system um, are following something that they feel is the right thing and they have justified it to themselves. But the architects of the system, like when peer review was installed, 
um, are, at a, are working at a higher level and for different reasons. There's a, D David F. Noble is a historian of science. He has explained this. He studied it. The, he wrote a paper about how peer review was, was, was started and why it was started. So you have to look at institutionally how it was created. You can't, of course, most scientists think of themselves as ethical, principled searchers of truth. I'm not sure all of scientists. Not all, most. And they, and they like to sure. have that vision of themselves, you see. Let me just conclude this way. If you want to know why carbon is so important and that why there's a fixation with CO2, Google things and research what the World Bank is doing. The World Bank wants carbon pricing. That means putting a price on CO2 emissions. They, they want it badly. And there's a reason for that. The IMF is all about encouraging the countries that they support and that they lend to to develop a carbon tax and, and cap and trade. These are not accidents. Do, do you think that the World Bank and the IMF are trying to save the planet? Do you think that they're trying to prevent a species extinction? Do you think that they're trying to, uh, you know, do good to, to mankind? Is there any evidence that they've ever tried to do that? Can you explain how this taxation works? So, just give a simple example. What? If they want to give money to Brazil, so where are I, I didn't get into all this Oh, I don't want to get into the mechanisms, but I'll just say very briefly that the, the mechanisms that are envisaged are ones where the people who want to control the world, the United States, would be allowed to prevent a developing country from burning as much uh, fossil fuel as they want. They'd be, uh, they'd be able to tax them and make them pay for their development. And so it's a serious lever of economic control and it's a serious lever, it's also a, a huge financial market when you start trading like that. So the, the, the big financiers benefit a lot, so they're all into uh, putting in this into action. So these are the kinds of mechanisms that I think are at play. And, but to, to end on a positive note, I want to show you another graph I'll just show it to you. I'll just describe it. This is a graph. This is. You want me to change it? All right. I, no. Do we need to do that? You can see it in your mind, right? I'm going to describe it. You see. Let's try it my way, okay? Let's just try it my way. Forget the technology for a minute. Here's. I'm going to show you a graph of public opinion in the United States on different issues. So the graph is as a function of time. And there, people are asked um, if they're more concerned about, you know, are, are, do you worry about the following things? Drinking water, lakes and rivers, air, rainforests, and global warming. And I'm happy to report that global warming is way at the bottom consistently over the last many, many years. So Americans have the common sense despite all the bad things we say about them, they have the common sense to realize that drinking water, their own drinking water, lakes and rivers, air, rainforests, are all much more important and more of a concern and to worry about than global warming. And the other thing that you'll notice when you look at this graph is that it's got regular spikes in it. And guess where the regular spikes occur? every eight years when you change from a two-term president to the next one. <laughs> what does that mean? What a coincidence, eh? So like, oh my God, there's all these dangerous things happening. We're going to save you. You need to change to the Republican Party or whatever, you know? Or they're going to tax or so on. Huh? The y-axis of that graph. No, it's 20% concern and it goes up to 80% concern. So global warming averages around 30% concern. Okay? So um, that is to end on a positive note. So that there is some hope. Not everyone is educated. 
and the uneducated will save us. Uh, you know, they, because they've got they've got common sense. You know, they they know what's really killing them. They know what the problems are in their lives. They don't they don't they're not over intellectualizing. Like you know, two degree change in surface temperature. Oh my God! Meanwhile, we're, Canada has just announced the Harper government has just announced that they can go in and bomb in Syria without asking Syria's permission or anyone's permission. Forget about a UN resolution. Forget about international law. We just go in there and bomb whenever we want, who we want, when we want. This has never happened before in the history of Canada. But they brought the to kill. No, no, stay serious for a minute. Stay serious for a minute. This is very serious. This is a rogue state that is telling the world we're going to go in and bomb whoever we want, when we want, just like the U.S. does, because we're, we're the little brother here, and we're going to do that when we want, how we want. This is happening here in our country. Well, wait a second. Okay? It's, it's, it's five planes. The Russians sort of can make them to Syria. They'll shoot down those five planes. Just like that, right? Okay. Think of the principle <laughs> of it. <laughs> I mean, no, I know. This I mean, is very serious. Violent. We're talking about war crimes. These are war crimes. It's a crime of aggression. Okay? And the Syrian, Syrian people have suffered enormously. Millions of people displaced, you know, tens of thousands killed. It's just an all-out war against these people. Why? Because, the, because Syria wants to stand on its own. It doesn't want to fall in line with the U.S. It, it, it prefers to trade and have allies with Russia and China. And therefore, it must be destroyed. That's what this is about. This is a total pretext for all-out destruction of Syria in order to get rid of that government. So it used to be that the U.S. would put in a new dictator, but that takes a lot of time and effort. You have to work for decades to get the right people in there to do it. Now they don't bother with that. If a country is disobeying, they, they don't have the leverage they used to have. They don't have the resources to do that. They just destroy the place. Libya, now Syria, they just annihilate the country. Doesn't matter what happens after. We don't want a regime that opposes U.S. wishes. Yemen too. Yemen has now joined the list. That's right. Yemen is a good example. And then, then you get all these stories in the media about how we're supposed to understand this. Come on. It's geopolitics. It's about the U.S wanting to control the world at any cost, willing to do whatever it takes, that's what it's about. Don't tell us about these religious wars and all this crap, which of course is true, but you always use racism and these things as a way to get what you want. And you, and you, you the powerful, and the people with resources and weapons, you're the ones who dictate that because racism is always easy to fire up, you know, and uh, especially when it's a life and death situation. That's what's going on here. They use that to and you have to be obedient intellectuals and you have to obediently worry about global warming and obediently worry about uh, that there's less democracy in Canada. Of course there's less democracy in Canada. They're out there being thugs. There can't be democracy in Canada in a situation like that. You know, like it's not a surprise. Um, and so ultimately, I think the conclusion of my talk is the only way we're going to um, save the planet and ourselves is to actually get involved and do something about it. I don't think that all this intellectual work about the science and so on is really going to help. It's, it just, it's a fog. It's just a fog. You can do it first year physics, you can figure it out, you can see clearly through it, it's a fog. That's what I think. That, and that, that's what I wanted to tell you guys. So we can stop the talk part and just get into questions and discussion and you can leave when you want and so on, but that, 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 that's first all I wanted to say. I just wanted to say that there, is, there are so many nuggets here and we have actually expended a lot of time on the, another topic which could have been uh, delayed for another occasion. But I want to, I want to read your 
um, attention to that graph that you showed where the delta C is very constant. Could you put it back on again? Oh, that was just my scribbling, you mean? Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was an excellent graph, and I'm just wondering. First of all, well, the they didn't try to touch it. The, the, the data is there, and the data must be real. And I'm just wondering. No, I don't agree with you that the data is there and the data must be real. May I See? just explain why? Let me put this up. Is it possible that the melting of the ice caps in the uh, Arctic and the subarctic is moderating the temperature to a point? Because there is such a thing as the latent temperature of um, transition from, from solid to liquid. So is it possible that the temperature is remaining constant as a result of this melting process? What melting? I, you know, I, I don't want to get into what the physical explanations for this, assuming that it's real, might be, okay? Because it's going to be complicated. You're going to have all kinds... Look, I've read all the top papers in physical review, uh, in, um, in nature about why we're not getting this agreement and what this plateau might be due to and I can tell you that even the scientists that are considered to know what they're talking about the things they're proposing can't possibly be the full answer it's just too tentative and they themselves will tell you it's tentative there is no explanation for this okay and part of the problem is I think that the data itself is not reliable whatsoever I would in another life have loved to have demonstrated that in great detail using the raw data. I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. But uh, I don't think anyone will ever get the funding to do that. But this is, in my humble opinion, crap data. This is the result of putting a bunch of very complicated things from weather stations and various sources and fudging and correcting and mapping differently and so on that produces something that you hope is publishable and if you produce the right thing it is publishable that's all this is I think I'm sorry but I'm going to stick to that opinion until I can see some convincing evidence to the contrary um, that, that's what I think but more importantly I don't think it matters we're talking about a tenth of a degree it may not matter but, but you have situations here that reveal some profound things. I mean, you told, you told us that the attentivity is much more important than... Yes, yes. And is it possible that the pollution rate that we are creating is changing the attentivity characteristic of planet Earth to such an extent that it, it could be the factor that we should be concentrating? Yes, and there's a lot of studies along that direction. There's a lot of studies about the effect of so-called aerosols and a high altitude uh, particulate pollution and the effect that has on cloud formation and uh, where those clouds are, what, what, how that affects this whole radiation balance story. I mean, there's lots and lots of studies about this. It's, it's okay? dismissing the whole thing. I'm not dismissing it. We should, we should concentrate on the, on the revelations of the equations that you have so masterfully put in front of Well, you know, we are not going to do anything when it comes to this because we don't matter okay um, there is an establishment that is taking care of this and you know the IPC reviews the same equations that I put on the board and then they say nonsense about them like that that 33 degrees is due to uh, the greenhouse the planetary greenhouse effect entirely I could read their statements for you I've written them in my papers it's incredible so uh, this, this shows you that truth doesn't matter, clear thought doesn't matter. These are political documents. Um, what more can I say? That's all. That's my message. I can't tell you any more than that. Um, you know, and, but I, I noticed there's a lot of hands up, and especially you, you had one up for a long time. One of your hands up yeah. for a long time. <laughs> um, I, Sorry, there's a lot of it, but uh, um, I think what, I, what I'd like to ask you is one of the things that's coming out of the, the fear of potential climate change um, is a push towards renewable energy. Uh, would you 
would you think that, I don't know how to form this question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that as, as one of the results of the fear. I think that re renewable energy is a load of crap. Okay, I think that uh, wind energy is just another industry. Uh, they don't look at the life cycle of making these instruments. They don't look at the labor conditions of the people who make them. They don't look at the frequency of accidents that occur. They don't look at the environmental impact uh, of the noise and, and, and other effects of these uh, fields. They don't, uh, you know, and this is typical. This is typical. Like, if you, if you have these policies that the World Bank wants to put into place, and you say, well, no problem, uh, we'll just uh, put carbon out of the atmosphere by growing forests over here. Well, what does that mean in practice? It means you go in where there are farmers, local farmers, and you disown them from their land, and you throw their families out, and you put them into garbage slums, and you steal their land and you grow forests there because you're getting international fund money to do that. So there, there are plenty of reports of the absolutely despicable consequences of these, of these policies in, in the developing world. Okay? It, it's, it's, and, and this is called a green policy. Okay? You go in there and you do this good green stuff. Well, the, 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 the alternative energy sources, it's the same sort of thing. You get this YouTube about this wonderful uh, road that has solar cells in it uh, that captures sunlight, you know. Come on. Have you looked at how much it is to produce that? Have you looked at the life cycle of, of, of that thing? Can you imagine what the potholes would do? Uh, I mean, there's just no way that these technologies make any sense at all. It's always about the simplest technology. You see, the way, the way to fix this problem, the way to fix this problem, here it is. And this was really the conclusion that I meant to give you, but that I forgot, and now I'm remembering it. The solution is the same whether you want to stop being a citizen in a country that decides it can kill anyone it wants or if you want to stop habitat destruction, or if you want to have a saner world, the solution is always the same. You need to have more democracy, but the true democracy, the democracy where people can actually have an impact. And the only place that Canadians can have more democracy is in Canada. And so the solution to all of these problems is that the people in the, the developing world need more democracy where they're trying to put in a mining company or trying to steal their land. They need more democracy there. If you give them more democracy, if you give them power to decide and you can't just steal and kill them and disappear them, then automatically the environment will flourish. There will be the best possible preservation if you have more democracy. For example, if you're fair to Aboriginal people in Canada, and instead of putting them on reserves and continuing their genocide that we have uh, perpetrated against that people, if instead you do reparation and you treat them fairly as they should be treated under international law, then you automatically have huge preservation of territory, huge preservation of ecosystems, and, and, and a stalling of this all-out destruction by mining companies and so on. So democracy and respect for peoples is the solution, I think, at this, at this point of the game. Uh, and it always is a help. It's always a solution. So, so not, the kind, not Obama democracy, not bonds, but true democracy, people controlling their local environment, their governments, and so on. That's what, that's what you need. That's the solution to all of these problems. So it's not about a new technology. It's not about uh, uh, David Suzuki telling us what kind of carbon uh, trading scheme we need in Canada and what kind of windmills we need and all this kind of stuff. That's not going to help. I'm sorry, but things are not going to get better uh, with those schemes.